Bulavinaka, everyone. Um, this being a Dev Policy and ANU organized seminar, may I first acknowledge the first people of Australia whose lands ANU stands on and also pay our humble respects to the collective of Pacific nations whose concerns we embrace as we join together seeking answers to what lies ahead. Sisters, gentlemen, friends from across the Pacific, those from around the globe who have joined us, thank you for your participation and interest. COVID-19 can be a depressing topic, but it certainly is an important one. And the question of what governments in our region are doing and can be doing to soften the blow certainly deserves our attention. So the warmest of welcomes to all attendees from the team at Dev Policy and Anissa Mbulavinaka from Suva as we all coalesce in hope and goodwill to listen to today's panel of economists. The Development Policy Center at the Australian National University is an independent think tank on aid and development to stress the independent part that's important for Australia and the region and for Fiji, where I come from. A thank you also and welcome to our panelists who join us from Port Moresby, Suva and from Canberra. I am Sadna Sen, friends, your chair for this webinar and the regional media advisor for the Development Policy Center. As a former journalist, may I extend a particularly warm welcome to the journalists from around the region who are with us today. To our esteemed panelists now, and in order of presentations, there are Stephen House. Stephen is a professor of economics and director of the Development Policy Center. He's been working on PNG in the Pacific since 2005. Stephen with his colleague Sherman Surandiran has taken the lead on the creation of the Pacific COVID economic database, the findings of which he will outline to us today. Next up is Dr. Jenny Gordon. A special welcome, Dr. Gordon. It is most inspiring to be welcoming a woman economist to this panel on the Pacific and no less than the, no less than the chief economist for um, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia. Dr. Gordon, prior to joining DFED, worked for the Productivity Commission as principal advisor research. She has a long history working on the economies of Asia and the Pacific, and will be providing her own expert and DFED's assessments of development in the region. Welcome, Dr. Jenny. We then move to Fiji and Dr. Nilesh Gounder. Nilesh is a senior lecturer with the Department of Economics at the University of the South Pacific and an expert and leading commentator on, Fiji, on the Fijian economy. Nilesh will be bringing us the latest on the Fijian economy. Nilesh, I am also proud to inform you, is the chair of the Sangam Education in Fiji, which runs some 26 schools across Fiji. The Sangam, since its borders closed, leaving thousands unemployed in Fiji, has been feeding the children and the parents through the schools. Mahola Palavel is next up, is a lecturer with the Division of Economics at the University of Papua New Guinea, where he teaches and analyzes the PNG economy as well as electoral politics. Maholopa is among a number of regular blog writers with Dev Policy, who also gets published in the PNG media. He'll be speaking on the PNG economic experience with and response to COVID-19. Just to explain the running order, we'll ask our four panelists to speak first. The idea is to maximize time for discussion. So the first speaker gets 15 minutes and everyone else 10 minutes. Our hardworking seminar organizing, organizer, Ari, will be communicating with speakers behind the scenes to keep them on time. And if they talk too long, they might be muted. So panelists, you have been warned. Some of our speakers have PowerPoints and they'll be sharing them with you. We are running this event over several countries. So if someone drops out, we may need to improvise. If you do have a question or comment, send it in by clicking on the Q&A, please. The Q&A icon and writing your question and comment out. Our panelists will see it, and if they are able to answer it or to address it, we will share the question and provide an answer during the Q&A. Please add your name and affiliation to the question unless you'd rather stay anonymous. 
We will also allow questions from the floor, but we do have a large number of people with us today. So I suggest if you have a question or comment, you put it in writing. But if you want to ask a question with your voice, click on the hand icon and we'll call on you during the Q&A. Finally, I do need to let you know that this the event is being recorded. So please bear that in mind if it is important to you. May I now please welcome our first panelist, Professor Stephen House, to introduce us to the findings of the Pacific COVID Economic Database. Stephen. Thank you, Sadhana, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot to all of you for joining. Uh, we're up to 167 participants, so it's great to see the interest in this. Of course, some of you will know that we uh, normally help organize the uh, Pacific Update in Suva with USP, and we work with UPNG on the PNG Update in Moresby every year. Of course, we can't do that uh, this year, but it's good to be able to keep the conversation going through these virtual interactions. Uh, so my job today is to explain uh, or introduce you to this new Pacific COVID economic database and to share with you some of the findings uh, from that. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, share my PowerPoint. Um, which I hope you can now all see. Uh, this is uh, joint work with uh, my colleague. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Let me just get this. Yeah. No. Uh, this is joint work with my colleague Sherman Surundaran. And at the outset, I'd like to thank Sherman uh, for all the hard work he's put into this project and also thank DFAT for its support through the Pacific Research Program. Uh, you know, there are other databases, obviously very useful databases around. Um, we decided to put this together because we wanted something focused on the Pacific, uh, focused on the economic response to COVID, uh, and something that made comparisons across countries uh, possible. And so we created this COVID, uh, sorry, Pacific COVID economic database. Uh, actually, it's a spreadsheet, but it always sounds better to call it a database. Uh, and, and we're going to put it up on the website uh, once this seminar uh, is over. Uh, we certainly, you know, of course, we hope you find it useful, uh, so something we want to keep working on, and we welcome your uh, feedback, comments, uh, any corrections or questions uh, that you have. The database itself goes beyond uh, only looking at the fiscal. You know, we also look at countries' monetary policy, exchange rate, uh, financial sector, uh, but it's fair to say the main focus is on the fiscal response, and that's what I'm going to talk about in my in my presentation today. Uh, so before uh, diving into you know the response, uh, what's the context? What are they responding to? Uh, and of course, in economic terms, they're responding to a big hit on GDP uh, as a result of this pandemic. And you can see, you know, these are projections uh, before and after the pandemic uh, for this year, and every country across the Pacific is taking a hit. Uh, but there is huge variation. Uh, and if you think about why that is, I mean, the thing that leaps out at you is tourism. You know, Fiji, Vanuatu, Palau, Cook Islands, these are the countries that are really reliant on tourism. And of, of all the sectors of the economy, international tourism's taken the biggest hit, uh, especially in this region where borders have been closed. And so, you know, the sectors come virtually ground to a halt. So definitely these are very difficult times. I know in, in Fiji, I've seen the, the estimate that one third of the workforce is out of work or, or working reduced hours. Uh, but I do want to also, by way of context, uh, just highlight some of the strengths actually that the Pacific brings uh, to respond to COVID-19. Uh, one of them is remittances. Remittances are very important for a number of Pacific countries. And it was thought that remittances would take a big hit um, as a result of the, the pandemic. And, and border closures, but actually the more recent data, we've now got data from Fiji and Samoa suggest in fact remittances are staying strong. You can see there was a, a fall in April, but there's since been a, a bounce back. And that may be to do with uh, stimulus packages in countries like Australia. Uh, it may be a sort of a, a rallying effect among the diaspora. Uh, it may also be that because people can't take cash with them traveling, they have, they have to use the formal 
mechanisms. Uh, but nevertheless, it is certainly a, a source of strength and hope. Uh, in terms of government uh, response, uh, you know, the Pacific is a very aid dependent region and, and maybe in general that's a mixed blessing, but certainly at a time of crisis, it's good to be able to draw on donor support. And this graph shows uh, for the seven countries we cover the amount of external assistance uh, already committed to the Pacific uh, following um, COVID-19. It's very variable, but certainly uh, significant. And then third, going beyond aid, uh, to look at the, the government's fiscal position more generally, uh, I mean, one thing that I've uh, come to realize is that a lot of Pacific governments actually went into this COVID-19 uh, with a surplus, uh, a background of fiscal surpluses, not just uh, last year, but for several years. Uh, some of them very large, as you can see from this graph. Uh, that's um, got a lot to do with a big increase in fishing license revenue that the Pacific has um, experienced or obtained. Um, but you know, it's a very, it's, it, and it doesn't apply to all countries uh, by any means, but certainly for those that have those, this is a good time to, um, you know, have a fiscal surplus to draw on. All right, so with that uh, impact and those, those starting points, uh, what has the Pacific done? Um, so we'll now go to some of the findings from our database and you'll see, as I mentioned, we do only cover seven countries. So that is one of the limitations. You know, we are a small team and this does require very detailed work. We wanted to include uh, Timor Leste, um, and, but apart from that, we have PNG, Fiji, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, and Tonga. So this shows the size of the sort of COVID funding package, the, the, the expenditure part of the stimulus packages announced in April. It shows it for the seven countries, and then uh, drawing on other databases and data uh, compares it to developing country average, developed country average, and Australia. A couple of things leap out. Uh, you know, one is that actually the Pacific response is on average pretty generous, right, or ambitious, uh, certainly compared to the average developing country response. Uh, and the second thing is, again, that enormous variation uh, that we see across the Pacific. So how do we explain that? That's the first question uh, we try to answer. Uh, I'll, I'll spare you sort of all the maths and just take you to the the bottom line. <laughs> and you don't need to worry about the numbers. Just look, we basically group the countries into three groups. Uh, I'll start at the, on the right-hand side. Uh, at the more generous end, we have Timor-Leste and Vanuatu, and they're running these self-finance packages. So their stimulus uh, is entirely uh, funded by their own resources, and not by borrowing, but by reserves. So Timor-Leste has its sovereign wealth fund, and Vanuatu is one of those countries that's been running surpluses. Uh, in its case, it's had this very successful uh, sort of modified citizenship scheme that it's been selling. And that's generated a lot of revenue in recent years. And that's been sitting there uh, offshore. It's ideal funding uh, for an emergency. So it's not that Timor-Leste and Vanuatu aren't uh, getting any aid or, or doing anything else. But when they announced their stimulus package, they said it's in, entirely self-funded. And when you've got those kind of reserves, well, you know, you can be generous with your uh, additional COVID funding. Then the second group's in the middle. It's what we call the aid finance group. And uh, that's a group of countries that, um, you know, there are various things going on. But if you look at the size of the COVID spend, it's pretty similar to the size of their external assistance. So these are countries that uh, have got a pretty good aid response and they're, they're counting on external donors to fund as a primary source of funding for their additional COVID spend. And then down the other end, we have the, uh, what, what we call the constrained group of Fiji and PNG. These are countries that went into the crisis already running a deficit, and so have limits on how much more they can borrow. Uh, in fact, in the case of PNG, our own projection is they're not going to be able to borrow any more than was originally budgeted for in a very large deficit. Uh, even if they can, uh, they've got big revenue shortfalls that they have to uh, fund. Uh, aid is not very important. Grant aid is not that important for these economies. Uh, so there's a limit to their capacity to fund additional COVID spending. And it's the same story for Fiji. Fiji is definitely borrowing more, uh, but it's got this massive revenue shortfall. And so its first priority has to be to meet that, and that squeezes out the room for additional spending. So these are the three groups. And if we go back to this graph, you can see that, well, Actually, PNG and Fiji are kind of exceptional for the Pacific, but they're, they're pretty typical for developing countries. But the other countries with access to reserves and uh, foreign aid uh, are able to put together more generous packages. 
So that's how we explain uh, the findings around the size of their funding package. Of course, the next question is, well, what are they spending the money on? Um, and that's, uh, what, what, that, that's what this table is about. We try to divide the spending into these categories, health, safety net, business support, food security, infrastructure. We still have a residual other category and it is sort of uh, frustratingly large, that category. It's still 30% uh, of the, uh, or a third of the, the total spend. Um, you know, some countries don't fully specify what they're gonna spend the money on. They, they have contingency funding. And then there's a whole range of miscellaneous things uh, from education to you know, funding uh, the army. Uh, but if we look at the categories we can actually specify, um, I think the interesting thing is that the biggest, uh, and by far, is uh, the safety net spending. I think that's interesting because the Pacific's often criticized for not spending enough on safety nets. You look at countries that don't have uh, safety nets in place, most of them are actually in the Pacific. Yet here they are uh, putting it as their first priority. Now, every country is spending something on safety nets, nets except for PNG, which is actually zero. Uh, Solomon Islands, which is not actually zero, but very close to zero. But the two countries that are driving this result are Timor-Leste and Vanuatu. And those are two countries, if you remember, have relatively large funding packages, and they definitely made uh, safety nets their first uh, priority. So it's interesting, this is not um, donor driven, right? These are these two countries using their own money, so putting safety nets at the top of the list. Uh, but they're doing it in very different ways. Uh, Vanuatu is taking a more sort of traditional or more common approach uh, for the Pacific, which is to uh, support those in the formal sector who have lost their job right, and provide some sort of temporary uh, unemployment benefits. That's a similar approach to uh, what Fiji is taking. Uh, Timor Leste is taking a much more universalist approach. It's basically putting in place a temporary basic income for all households, uh, and, and, and so not just benefiting that minority. Uh, in, the, uh, in the formal sector. Uh, I think the challenge for, for both countries is that these are just temporary measures. Right? These are, this is a, a safety net just for a few months. And I guess that made sense back in April when uh, they were putting together these uh, emergency packages and perhaps you know, we thought this pandemic is going to last a few months. But as it's uh, stretching out into the future, of course the question arises, well, what, what comes next? And that takes me to the last part of this uh, this presentation. Um, what we've been talking about so far are those stimulus packages announced in April, but we've also started in the database to look at the government's uh, budgets for the next year. And in a way, I think that's more interesting and informative because those budgets are more comprehensive uh, and they're more comparable uh, across countries. Uh, so far, there are three countries that have delivered budgets for 2021 uh, Fiji, Samoa, and Tonga. And so the next few slides just focus on those, um, on those three countries. Um, yeah, so just to try to understand uh, what's going on in those budgets, let's take you back to the, the first uh, graph. You know, this is the big hit uh, to GDP uh, Fiji's experiencing. Uh, Samoa might be a little bit optimistic. Um, but that uh, differential economic hit uh, follows through into revenue. So these three bars are just 18, 19, 19, 20, and 2021. 20, and you see all the countries are anticipating for a reduction in revenue, uh, but in Fiji, it's really, it's huge. It's only, revenue's gonna half, comparing 18, 19 to 20, 21. Uh, and moreover, the other two countries, Samoa and Tonga, uh, have foreign aid to fall back on. Right here, aid is shown as a proportion. These are all indexes, but aid shown as proportion of own revenue uh, in the in the base year eighteen nineteen, uh, and and this is grant aid. It's very important for both Samoa and especially Tonga. And here, Samoa is showing a small increase after inflation. Tonga, a larger increase. So that's help helps them offset uh, that the, the more moderate revenue loss uh, they're anticipating. Uh, whereas with Fiji, uh, the aid is uh, it's, it's really tiny uh, in the first place and not showing an increase. Uh, so therefore, Fiji has to borrow, right? And Fiji is actually planning a deficit of 20%. Now, a lot of this borrowing is uh, concessional. So it's not as if they're not benefiting from external 
assistance, uh, but it is a very different strategy to Samoa and Tonga, who are both planning uh, some amount of borrowing, but much more, much more moderate. Uh, so what's the bottom line uh, from all this? Uh, I put the, the bottom line is in the next graph. The bottom line is what happens to spending. Right? Um, what we actually want these countries to do is not just protect aggregate spending, uh, but spend more. You know, when you're facing a depression and when there are a lot of uh, vulnerable households, you want the government to increase its spending. That's what we're doing in Australia. We're actually increasing our spending by about a third uh, in response to COVID. Uh, but it's a very different situation in the Pacific. Uh, Tonga, with its uh, aid dependence, is able to project an increase in spending, but Fiji is just able to hold the line and Samoa is actually anticipating a slight reduction in aggregate expenditure. Uh, and that's how I'd sum it up. I'd say that in the short term, you know, most Pacific countries have done a, a good job of putting in place a reasonably generous uh, sort of COVID funding package. Uh, but longer term, we see countries are going to struggle. And certainly, you know, if you think, well, countries should be putting, uh, should be extending those safety nets. Uh, the question becomes, you know, where are they going to get the funding from? They're already anticipating an increase in aid. They're borrowing where they, where they can. Uh, and yet, uh, except for Tonga, when out of these three, we're not seeing an increase in aggregate uh, expenditure. It's not realistic to expect these countries to really uh, restructure and cut other expenditure uh, at this difficult time. So I think the challenge uh, remains, uh, the longer term external financing challenge is really the one uh, we need to focus on going forward. Uh, so I'll, I'll finish there. Um, Please do check out our analysis on the debt policy blog. Uh, have a look at the database yourself and, and send us your feedback. Uh, but uh, thanks very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Stephen. That was certainly illuminating. I'm sure there are lots of questions. Um, in fact, we've already got some, but we're going to go straight to the next speaker and uh, please keep your questions and comments coming by clicking on the q a icon and um, sending in your contribution or if you want to ask a question at the end please um, click on the hand icon um, may we please now invite dr jenny gordon to speak dr gordon Thank you very much. Uh, I think Stephen's covered a lot of uh, ground, so I will uh, I may be able to save you some time and create some more time for questions at the end. Um, obviously, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia and our um, Official Development Assistance Program is incredibly focused on the Pacific. And it's, it's really sort of scary to see that COVID-19 is putting at risk so many of the gains that um, Pacific Island countries have made over the last sort of decade or so. And that's um, clearly a, a major concern um, to the Australian government and something that uh, I think we, we're all sort of trying to work out better ways of, of dealing with um, so that we, we can make sure we can protect the gains that have been made and, uh, and not put them at risk. Uh, and Stephen, I think, has highlighted some of the challenges in doing that. So I just wanted to quickly go through, um, you know, when you, when, if you're going to put circles on, on countries to try and understand um, the impacts of COVID-19, uh, the circles I've got there kind of are uh, the, uh, the economic ones. And so you've got um, Papua New Guinea and Fiji particularly badly impacted by, um, by COVID-19. Uh, Papua New Guinea, mar largely through the LNG price, which is, um, gone through the floor and so as a major LNG exporter that's a, a major challenge and now of course that they're facing um, health risks that uh, you know that other countries the other countries in the Pacific have largely been able to um, to avoid which has been good uh, you've got um, Fiji obviously highly tourist dependent and Steve has took us through the issues there but you've also got uh, Samoa and Tonga and Vanuatu very dependent on tourism. I think Vanuatu's tourism and cruise ships um, were the first to sort of dry up very quickly and one wonders how long it's going to take for cruise ships to, um, to recover. Um, but then as Stephen also mentioned, Kiribati and Tuvalu and those countries, the fishing revenues have put them in better 
in better shape than they would be um, otherwise. So if you think about the economic uh, conditions of the, in terms of the current impact, it's actually a little different though from where the starting point um, was for these, these different countries. Um, and so if we sort of think about the exposure to, um, to COVID-19, you can see that it's uh, tourism, Vanuatu is the most exposed, Fiji, Samoa, Tonga, Tuvalu, Kiribati, and, and Solomon Island, less so. There's some debate about the size of tourism for the GDP in, in Solomon Islands. But Tonga and Samoa, much more remittance um, dependent. I'm a little less sanguine. The remittances have stayed as uh, stable because we do measure them through the formal channels as opposed to the informal channels of travel and people handing over cash. And so I suspect they might be more dented um, than, than otherwise. And then the other question about remittances is for many of these island economies, uh, domestic remittances are also a very important part of the, um, the income to particular households within these countries. And so um, remittances are an issue. Uh, and can commodity exposure, I've mentioned LNG, uh, logging is also very important to Solomon Islands and has been less affected, but um, still somewhat affected. There's some survey work coming out now to actually measure the employment impacts. Um, and the measures are around about a third of Fijians have, have lost their jobs or had substantially reduced hours, which is not surprising given the collapse of the tourist industry. And then you've got to think about the starting point, which is the level of poverty exposure in the different, different countries. Uh, and uh, while some countries, Fiji and others, um, have very, very little uh, poverty, so they're sort of starting in a good place, um, you have some of the other countries that are more vulnerable to um, higher rates of poverty. And those are something that we do need to be concerned about. There was looking at which countries had actually had social protection systems. And so this is a really um, interesting area because if you have a social protection system, it's quite easy to expand that fairly rapidly. Um, but if you don't have one in place, it's quite challenging to actually get the, the um, the funding out. So even if you have funding available, the extent to which you can get funding out to these different, um, to, you, to your population is quite different. And in the red zone of no existing social protection scheme is Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands and Vanuatu. So even though Vanuatu have quite a big COVID package, it's not a package that's necessarily going to get out to the sort of the most vulnerable and poor in the community. Um, you have uh, Fiji actually has a very good and advanced social protection system, which makes it um, easier for them to, to get resources out to the most needy uh, in the community. Whereas um, Tonga is in a similar situation. It's got an elementary um, level social protection system and is able to expand and use that. So there's differing degrees of, um, of capacity. And I think one of the things that um, the uh, Asian financial crisis taught us in Southeast Asia was setting up good social protection uh, infrastructure so that when you have problems like this, you can get resources out to the most needy is actually a, something sort of well, a really worthwhile investment to think about over time. So um, that's something that uh, obviously the aid program has been very focused on is how do you really protect the most needy in these countries um, because whenever you have a loss of income you end up with a rise in poverty and it's usually the uh, the most needy who uh, who are going to suffer most and we're concerned about educational outcomes we're concerned about um, uh, particularly domestic violence and um, children uh, being uh, not being able to access school and those kinds of issues um, so I want to focus the remainder of my talk on thinking about where the recovery is going to come from. And this is actually the really challenging question, I think, for the Pacific, because um, we've had exports as a driver of growth. So you've really had tourism as a major driver of growth throughout the Pacific. We've had growth in the Pacific labour market, um, particularly over the last decade. Um, and that's been something that... Um, the Development Assistance Program has been working to build that Pacific labour market um, in Australia, and it's been working very well, win-win for uh, 
our agricultural producers in particular, but also a win for um, uh, people in those countries who can come over and earn a good living and take that money home back to their own communities. Um, you've had seen resources in some of the countries, particularly Papua New Guinea, and then as I mentioned earlier, you've had fishing growth. Uh, but you've actually also had the government and government spending as a driver of economic growth in a number of the Pacific economies. And so investment in economic services, particularly infrastructure, so um, communications, water systems, um, electrification have been very big investment areas. And then also investment in human services, um, improving health services, education services. And so it's really quite challenging when government spending has been a major driver of, um, of growth in a number of these economies, when the government is spending is likely to be highly constrained in the future for the reasons that, that Stephen's gone through. So what are we looking for? We're looking for the global recovery to try and recover those export markets. Uh, we're looking for local stability which is incredibly important for success for global recovery to translate through into tourism in particular. Um, and we're looking to access to finance because it's quite challenging for the private sector businesses who've been negatively impacted through COVID-19 to um, maintain their assets. Um, and there have been some holds on bank loans and the like, but um, how long those bank loan holidays are going to to last and then the capacity to repay the accumulated loan depends on the recovery of the business and the recovery of the business in many cases depends on the recovery of the export markets and so you've got this kind of we come back to the global recovery problem so what's our post-covid economy is going to look like um, we might need to be having much greater focus on local production there's been considerable pressure in some countries uh, on the sort of more subsistence agriculture end of the scale where people have moved back from urban to rural areas and they've found that um, the population pressure has been quite challenging. Uh, we clearly need to have your economic services, um, you know, keep the lights on, the water running, um, those kinds of things in order to be able to support the tourism industry, uh, but also to recover other areas. And clearly, again, human services are really critical because the investing in human capability strategy is a really important part of the Pacific's sort of economic growth strategy, but also supporting that Pacific labor market. So if we think about an export recovery sequence, resources are likely to recover earliest, though it might be some time before we see considerable rise in energy prices. So um, that makes take time. Though again, COVID-19 affected areas, as we've seen closed down in mines in Papua New Guinea because of, of recent outbreaks of COVID-19. But hopefully those can be brought under control quickly and those um, can recover. And I think, uh, you know, we should be talking a bit more about that. There's potential in agriculture and export agricultural products of high value products. Um, continued uh, return of labor markets and the Pacific labor market, and then return of tourism. And if we just think about the, the reason I put them in that sequencing is that I thought this was a very slightly amusing uh, chart really that was done by the UNWTO on tourism recover. So it's a world tourism and this was done back in March and they had these scenarios of um, how quickly they thought things would recover. And we all know now we're sitting here towards the end of um, August, we've got nothing like the um, recovery of the blue dot that they had been so optimistic about. And I suspect that, um, you know, the recovery of international tourism is going to be very slow. Um, Australian tourism operators clearly uh, are impacted by this, but on the other hand, you know, Australians are a big um, consumer of international tourism. And so if they tourist at home, they'll be doing a lot better than if they're touristing, you know, for the, uh, the operators here. But Pacific Islands generally don't have that option. They need the international tourists to, re to recover, to be able to get that industry up and running. And then when we look at remittances, um, this is just the, um, the World Bank coming out of IMF uh, Finance and Development in June, their projections of um, how quickly these things are going to turn around. Um, 
and it's quite useful to see what they're thinking about foreign direct investment um, and how long that's going to take to recover, as well as, um, you know, also the, the remittance market. So they're hoping it's going to bounce in and be back up in 2021, but it'll still be well below uh, the levels of several years earlier. So um, they're anticipating that that will take quite some time to recover. Um, we may do better in the Pacific because we may be able to establish a, a travel bubbles earlier, um, given the low rates of infection in the Pacific, but um, it, it will be an issue as to how long that takes, uh, particularly with high rates of unemployment in a lot of the economies that um, currently uh, have been taking uh, Pacific labour workers in. And then just to, to finish off, the way we're trying to work our way through this is to understand the size of the, the issues, where the challenges are, is we're sort of, and we've got to think about the next four years. So in terms of financing gap, it's not much point just financing this year's deficit for, for governments. We actually need to be thinking about how they're going to finance those deficits in the out years and what the size of those deficits are going to be in, in the out years. We uh, are looking obviously to the government's fiscal situation, asking questions about what's essential expenditure, what's other expenditure, um, trying to do revenue projections given the high dependence of um, revenue on a lot of the export revenue that's earned. So government revenue is dependent on export revenue. So you're then again looking for the external exports to recover. Um, borrowing capacity and the extent to which there's scope to borrow from the multilateral banks. Uh, and then also um, thinking about uh, whether there's other donors out there. Um, the, potential to borrow from domestic sources, which has been a major source of revenue for a number of countries, such as at Fiji in funding budget deficits, is probably going to be much more highly constrained uh, and definitely constrained further and further over time uh, due to the economic impacts. We're thinking about economic security and how to maintain the basic uh, services of, you know, electricity and communications and water, but also the social protection, issues around COVID case numbers, which have been very um, fortunately very low across most of the Pacific countries. But uh, there has been diversion how we can make sure the health system remains robust and the education services uh, can still be provided. Economic infrastructure services, a lot of issues around utility funding. A lot of governments, um, part of their COVID-19 packages have been to, um, to uh, forgive power bills and other sorts of bills, but unfortunately that doesn't help SOEs that, um, or private sector providers that are already a bit, um, you know, struggling to, to re pay the return on the capital that they've invested. And so that's quite challenging and how those SOEs um, will come out of this and whether this is an opportunity to think about whether there are private players who can bring additional resources in to uh, improve the quality of infrastructure and put in place some more robust user pay systems in some of the countries. Um, and then thinking about the regulatory systems to support all of that so that you can actually have good markets for those kinds of services. Um, and then thinking about private sector recovery and which is critical for revenue recovery. And um, I've gone through most of those areas, but um, the last one is manufacturing and smart manufacturing and what is needed to kind of recover some of the smart manufacturing uh, opportunities that might be there. And then critical to everything is maintaining social stability. And this is really challenging. And so this is where we come back to social protection programs, ensuring we look after the most vulnerable, thinking about how do you do things as governments or as donors to ensure they're as, um, creating as much employment as possible. So for the AIFFP, thinking about infrastructure investments that will be more employment creating than we would have need to think about before um, the, uh, the COVID-19. Thinking about the outcomes for income distribution and making sure that uh, what gains there are are shared and then the quality of governance in countries. So there's all the issues that we're sort of trying to think about, not just for this coming year, but also for the next four years. Um, 
so I think uh, with that, uh, it's a challenging, it's a challenging issue managing COVID-19, I think is, uh, and it's probably will just bring to the fore many reforms that probably would have been on the cards further down the line. And so can we use this opportunity to actually um, really think about reform? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. Um, timely reminder that while we deal with today, we also have to think of ahead. And it's good to know that DFED certainly thinking four years ahead. Um, we do have a number of questions now, but we are going to stick to our plan of listening to all our speakers first before turning to Q&A. Please keep those questions coming um, on your um, um, Q&A uh, part of the screen. Next up, we um, welcome Dr. Nilesh Gounder from USB to provide a perspective on Fiji. Um, Nilesh. Um, Nilesh, you'll have to unmute your um, self. Sorry, there you go. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sadna. And good afternoon, uh, everyone out there from Suva. Uh, I don't have any slides, uh, but I'll just try to, to cover uh, some key indicators uh, for Fiji, uh, some key issues and challenges uh, facing the Fijian policymakers, uh, as well as provide uh, uh, some uh, some uh, issues in terms of how the COVID-19 crisis uh, has impacted the Fijian economy, and and how that uh, has impacted households um, uh, in 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 turn. So firstly, it's now over 120 days since the last uh, case of COVID-19 in Fiji was reported outside a border quarantine facility, which is a good sign uh, that we don't have any community transmission uh, in Fiji for, for slightly over 120 days now. We have a small number of uh, active COVID-19 cases, uh, but uh, those are all uh, border, in border quarantine uh, facility. Uh, the economic impact, uh, as Stephen mentioned, uh, on Fiji and, and, and PNG has been relatively larger. Uh, the Fijian economy is projected to contract by around 22% uh, in, in 2020. And uh, the, the, the direct impact uh, on, on the GDP uh, incomes and economic activity has basically come from the, the, the contraction of the tourism industry which accounts for around 35% of GDP, both directly and, and, and indirectly. And as the tourism industry remains uh, almost in a shutdown mode, uh, it has uh, impacted uh, the Fijian economy uh, in, a, in, a, in a big way. Uh, there has been some revival uh, in some pockets uh, of the tourism industry, especially from domestic tourism after the recent budget uh, announcement which reduced uh, taxes directly within the tourism industry. So there has been some, some domestic tra tourism uh, in, in some, some quarters, which uh, will show uh, some positive uh, growth in the tourism industry in the, in, in the recent months. And uh, because of the 22% the, the, the decline in GDP, uh, it has uh, had a huge impact in terms of unemployment as businesses have um, either shut down or scaled back um, operations. And based on the, um, on the Fiji National Provident Fund uh, figures, this is uh, the number of people who have applied for, for unemployment uh, funding. Uh, it's around um, 85,000 uh, workers who have either lost jobs or are on on reduced hours, so they have they have applied to to use their um, the the pension funds uh, during during this time. Uh, the government has attempted to provide some relief uh, to those who have lost uh, jobs um, uh, in the last budget. So those who are fully unemployed uh, will be able to receive two hundred and twenty dollars per fortnight. Uh, and uh, it also announced a third phase of COVID-19 relief payments uh, through Fiji National Provident Fund. But it's important to note that this is not a benefit which is uh, coming from the government directly. Uh, 
but these are provisions that are being made by the government so that members are able to access their pension funds uh, since they are unemployed. The government has contributed some amount uh, by topping up uh, where workers don't have enough funds in their in their pension uh, in their pension fund uh, fund accounts. And um, the other sectors in Fiji that have been uh, impacted in a big way include accommodation and food services sector, which was uh, heavily reliant on the tourism industry. And the transport and storage sectors have also been impacted uh, in a big way. And, and, and these, uh, the accommodation and food services and transportation and storage sectors uh, relied heavily uh, on the tourism industry. And, 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 and due to a, such a large contraction in vista arrival, these industries have been impacted. And uh, due to the, the large contraction in GDP, uh, we, uh, we have seen uh, reduced disposable incomes, increased unemployment, uh, subdued business confidence, as well as constrained uh, fiscal space as well. And investment uh, spending is also forecast to fall to around 12.8% of GDP uh, from an average of about 20% uh, in the last uh, few years so we are expecting investment to, to go down and this will have an impact not only now but in the in the short to medium term as well and Jenny mentioned about recovery not only now but in the short to medium term. I think it's important to 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 to, to take into account how this this one year uh, is going to have an impact in the short to short to medium term uh, going forward. The, the sectors which have uh, provided some relief during this time in Fiji include agriculture and, uh, and the health sectors. The health sector is, is because the amount of money that has been uh, spent in the health sector and there's been increase uh, in allocation to the health sector. And the agriculture sector has been a, a source of relief for, for many of those who have lost jobs. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, a lot of people have actually fallen back to agriculture uh, as a source of livelihoods. Uh, they've gone back to the farms and they're using uh, uh, idle land uh, to plant and, and, and uh, feed their, their family. So uh, agriculture sector has seen, uh, seen a slight rejuvenation, especially uh, after the COVID-19 crisis. Not only because um, those who are employed are falling back uh, to, to agriculture as a source of uh, economic activity, but also the realization that there is a need to diversify uh, the economy and, and, and slowly over time reduce the reliance uh, on, 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 tourism, on tourism industry. Uh, the forecast for next year is, is uh, the Fiji economy is expected to, to grow by around 14%. This, I think, is a highly optimistic uh, forecast, uh, given the, the, the scenario now and, and how we expect the next six months uh, or the next six to 12 months uh, uh, to, uh, to turn out to be. And the current account deficit is now forecast to widen to about 10.7% of GDP from 4.9% in 2019. And that mainly due to decline in tourism and remittance uh, inflows. But as Stephen mentioned, uh, there hasn't been a, in a, in, in a reduction in remittance as as, uh, as some of us expected uh, sometime back in March. I mean, which is a good sign that uh, remittance uh, hasn't fallen uh, in a in a big way. So, uh, looking at the at the at the unemployment figures, the current unemployment rate would be somewhere around 30 to 35 percent, which is uh, which is which is big. Uh, for 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 uh, for Fiji or certainly any any Pacific island uh, economy, uh, the poverty rate in 2013-2014 was around 28 percent, and um, with this unemployment rate and uh, with the economic growth rate uh, forecasted to be around negative 22 percent, we'll only expect um, unemployment uh, sorry poverty rate uh, to go up uh, in the in the short term and. Uh, and uh, Jenny also mentioned about the, the development gains. I think that's really important as to how we have lost uh, the development gains and some of the development gains that we might be losing if this crisis um, continues. And, and, and poverty is one of those, uh, reduction in poverty is one of those gains that Fiji was continuously making over time. Uh, 
there might be some reversal in those gains. But there are other areas that um, there might be reversals as well in terms of the gains that have previously been, uh, been made. And all this uh, is also impacting uh, the sustainable development goals as well. And I think COVID-19 has come right into the track of COVID-19 goal spending as well. And poverty was one of those uh, goals and Fiji was targeting reducing poverty uh, from 28% in 2015 to around 14% in 2030. And uh, uh, because of COVID-19, there'll be a huge dent in terms of achieving that, that target rate of 14%. Uh, of, 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 of and similarly, uh, there is a huge uh, challenge in terms of SDG financing now uh, due to fiscal, fiscal constraints. And looking forward to, to, the, to the next year, uh, based on the 2020-2021 budget, the revenue forecast is 1.6 billion, which is um, down by around a billion dollars uh, compared to 2019-2020. To and expenditure is forecasted to be 3.6 billion, uh, which is down by a billion, uh, sorry, down by 100 million from 2019-2020 uh, uh, budget. And as uh, Stephen mentioned, uh, government debt has gone up. Uh, it's expected to be around 8.2 billion by July 2021. And that would be around 83.4% uh, of, of, of GDP. And as um, uh, economic activity is down, tax revenue is down as well. And in 2020-2021, fiscal year, tax revenue is half of what it was in the 2018-2019 year. And toll revenue is also half of what it was in the 2018-2019 uh, fiscal year. And that has uh, put a huge challenge on governments to continue spending. And uh, with um, expenditure of 3.6 billion, uh, that is uh, the forecast for 2020-2021 fiscal year, uh, government has had to borrow uh, around $1.5 billion uh, to, to finance uh, its expenditure. Uh, and that has uh, increased uh, its debt uh, to around $8.2 billion, uh, which equates to about 83-4% of GDP. And, and I have serious concerns about uh, this, this debt level. Uh, even though GDP may go back, nominal GDP may go back to around $10, $11, $12 billion, uh, say in two years time, uh, it will be a huge challenge for Fiji to, to, to pay off uh, this, um, this debt of, of, of around 8.2 uh, billion uh, dollars. And on the ground, I think um, uh, the mostly affected areas uh, has been the, the Western division of, 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 of Fiji or Viti Levu, the, the, the area from Coral Coast all the way to Lotoka which is where the tourism industry was, uh, was concentrated uh, in. And um, as Sadna mentioned, uh, I'm on the board of the Sangam Education Board, and uh, we run around 26 schools, and most of the schools fall along this corridor. And uh, our survey has shown that uh, there is a huge unemployment rate around this, around this tourism belt, and that has had a huge impact in terms of parents' ability to provide the students with with um, with proper meals uh, and 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 other and other supplies uh, to children, and a lot of um, civil society organisations are actually doing a great job in Fiji now, helping out um, children and, and 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 families and households to cope with the with the with the crisis. And, and I must uh, thank all the civil society organisations because there's only so much the government can do during this time. Uh, and, and the government is faced with the huge revenue sh uh, shortfall as well. So they haven't been able to, to, to provide the kind of support that is given in, 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 in other countries and in, in developed countries. And this is where I think the gap has been filled by civil society organizations. Uh, but uh, then again, there's only so much the civil society organizations can do. But if this, this, uh, this, this crisis continues and we expect it to at least go until December, I think we, uh, we, uh, we will be seeing uh, uh, a, uh, a kind of a humanitarian crisis developing uh, in Fiji uh, as, as, as um, the tourism industry remains shut down and almost everybody in the tourism industry is, uh, is without a job now. 
and that has had a spillover effect in other industries uh, and, and areas. And I think it's really important to talk about the recovery process and, and the key of that would be tourism. Uh, and uh, secondly, how to boost um, exports, uh, but that also depend on, on how the other economies are doing. And beyond that, I think bringing back business confidence will be a challenge, uh, even as, 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 as uh, the, the COVID-19 crisis recedes and, and borders uh, slowly, slowly uh, open up. And uh, I agree with uh, uh, Stephen that labor mobility can play some role uh, if, if it's able to, to materialize. Uh, uh, we have high unemployment rate, not only in Fiji, but other Pacific Island countries as well. And if there's some labor mobility scheme that can be implemented during this time, it will provide some relief uh, to, to Pacific Island countries. So I think I'll stop there and uh, we can discuss more uh, during question and answer session. Thank you. Sangal, you are muted. You need to unmute yourself. Uh -huh. Vina Kanilesh, I think a number of us share the concerns that you raise about uh, Fiji. Quite scary, actually. Lucky those who do have jobs, however. Um, finally, could I please now invite our final speaker, UPNG lecturer Maholo Palavel. Please do send in a question, your questions uh, um, to the Q&A. Um, um, and, and if you want to ask these questions yourself, just click on the um, little hand icon if you want to ask a question in person. Um, Maho, Binaka. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so PNG has been hit pretty hard, uh, not only economically, uh, it's also been hit hard um, health-wise. Just this weekend, we've had um, over 320 positive cases, and we've had three uh, COVID-related deaths so far. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a pretty bad time for PNG and the PNG economy. Um, and I think uh, Jenny and Stephen have alluded to that, and I'll I'll try to speak more on uh, my take on what's happened in the PNG economy. So my presentation will be in three parts, and yet the first part will uh, try to tell the story of PNG's economy so far prior to uh, the COVID-19 impact across uh, several macroeconomic indicators. So, for example, uh, GDP growth, uh, growth per capita, and uh, employment. Uh, fiscal deficit as well. And then the second part will try to detail the pandemic's impact on uh, the PNG economy. And the third part will uh, conclude and try to cover what's uh, next in terms of uh, PNG's economy. So the pre-COVID GDP growth. Um, this graph tracks uh, PNG's real GDP growth and non-resource GDP growth according to the uh, 2020 national budget. It also includes ADB's projections for 2020 and 2021. So GDP growth, um, shown by the blue line, if you can see, was uh, pretty low in um, 2015 to 2017. So this was after the boom period of the early 2010s and also after the PNG LNG construction phase had ended. And uh, 2015 to 2017 was a period of low commodity prices. So growth has recently been recovering. Um, in 2018, if you can see from the graph, uh, we had uh, negative 0.8% total GDP growth uh, because of the um, 2018 Southern Highlands earthquake, and this subdued the extractive industry. Uh, but the 2020 budget projected um, GDP growth to recover, and it was um, projected 2% growth uh, this year. Uh, looking at the uh, non-resource GDP growth, um, which is an estimate uh, in place of uh, gross national income because the data is uh, lacking here in PNG. Um, and 80% of Papua New Guineans are engaged in the non-resource sector. So this also slowed um, in the lead up to uh, 2018 was low growth after the, um, the end of the PNG LNG construction phase and had a mild recovery uh, until 2020. 
if we look at um, non-resource, well, GDP per capita first or GDP per person, that was increasing in the um, early to mid 2000, 2010, and has um, pretty much tapered off and decreased uh, since 2014. So uh, 2019, uh, GDP per person stood at 7,500 kina. So this is adjusting for inflation and it's lower than its level in 2017. So we've, uh, kind of, um, we've kind of gone backward in that sense. Uh, GDP per person in the non-resource sector has also um, pretty much decreased from 2018 to 2019 and stands at about 5,400 kina per person. So the average non-resource GDP per capita was um, 2.1% uh, between 2000 and 2013, and it was much, much lower in 2013 to 2020 at 0.2%. Uh, and this, is, um, this largely reflects um, population growth. So average population growth over this period, uh, 2010 to 2020, was about 2%, and uh, GDP uh, growth has not uh, matched that uh, population growth. Uh, in terms of employment, so this is an index of um, private sector employment. So this is what the Bank of PNG um, releases uh, to gauge at least formal private sector employment. So this excludes the uh, public service. So as you can see from 2013, which is the end of the um, LNG, PNG LNG construction phase, employment has been falling. Since then, uh, this index accounts for around 10% of PNG's workforce. Uh, 2013 was um, the period of the highest uh, private sector employment since independence. And uh, employment today uh, is about 87% of its 2013 levels. Uh, there was a bit of recovery in the APEC phase, but that has not held through. Over the same period, population has grown at about 30%, so the private sector has not um, really brought people in from the informal sector to employ them. Uh, this does not show the public service uh, employment, which has actually been growing uh, in the same period. Uh, so slide five, uh, government revenue adjusting for inflation has been relatively flat since 2010. Revenue fell in 2019 because the uh, General Revenue Commission and customs collections were below target reflecting slow economic growth and lower commodity prices. Uh, expenditure has also grown in the same period and is now 40% higher than 2007. So the salaries component of expenditures has grown over the same period as well, uh, and is now 30% of expenditure. So this is um, salaries of public servants. All this has led to uh, government running fiscal deficits since 2012. The fiscal deficit budget for 2020 was um, 4.63 billion kina, or 5% of nominal GDP, and is the highest deficit since independence. Um, with COVID-19, this deficit is forecasted to increase by further 2.2 billion kina. So interest costs now. Um, so this graph shows the interest cost burden, um, which is a ratio of uh, government revenue. So this is interest cost to debt that government has incurred so far. Um, this ratio fell to 5% in 2010 and has been increasing to 17.3% in 2019. Um, under the 2020 budget, interest costs were estimated to be 12.5% of expenditure. Uh, total debt so far has been uh, estimated at 37.2 billion kina, or 40% of GDP, and only 13% of this is externally sourced or in concessional form. So the interest costs you see here are mostly made up of domestic debt. Uh, so far, the um, PNG government has raised 2 billion kina from the primary market um, at 12.5 uh, interest rates and 10 year maturity. And the IMF also issued a 363 million interest free loan. And these combined should likely push uh, debt to GDP over the uh, debt limit which is 45% uh, debt to GDP, so the debt limit uh, legally. So this was the story of um, the PNG economy so far. So the impact of COVID-19. Um, so 10,000 workers have been laid off according to the Trade Union Congress. And so that adds to the um, 
unemployment woes that PNG is already suffering from. Uh, the extractive sector is a major component of GDP and exports and all mineral prices uh, except gold. So uh, LNG prices, copper, nickel, and crude oil prices are all lower than the um, 2020 budget assumptions. So this should all uh, lead to um, very much lower government revenue. Uh, infrastructure project delays as well have, been, have occurred uh, because inputs like labor and physical capital have been hampered by border closures and quarantine measures. Econom the economic growth um, estimate from the budget of 2% uh, for 2020 has been revised downward with ADB estimating a negative 1.5% growth for this year. And government revenue will experience an estimated shortfall of 2.2 billion kina. And this will likely lead to a large cash flow problem for government as it struggles to maintain uh, salaries for its public servants and um, service delivery. So the um, 5.7 billion economic stimulus was announced in April uh, to combat the economic uh, impact that would have happened or at least has happened. Uh, and this is comprised of uh, external funding of about 1.5 billion kina. So this has come from the IMF, uh, ADB in, in Australian government, um, 2.5 billion kina in treasury bonds, which I've already men mentioned, uh, a loan moratorium and tax deferrals for three months. So that's already ended. It was from April to June and new uh, government spending of about 600 million kina. So the 600 million uh, kina actually reflects um, the limited fiscal space that the government um, has at the moment. And uh, so the 600 million kina in additional spending is broken up into two parts, mainly uh, 280 million kina to support the health sector and 320 million kina to support agriculture, households and businesses. So um, additional comments, uh, how much of the financing uh, for 2020 is unclear. So how much of uh, the debt that uh, PNG will go into uh, to fund the 4.6 billion that was initially announced as a deficit and how much will go on to finance the increased deficit that we're experiencing right now. Uh, another point to uh, make here is that superannuation excess, which was announced in April, has been deferred to this month. And it is only in this month that uh, unemployed workers are able to access their um, pension funds. Uh, and the additional 600 million kina, as I said before, reflects a limited fiscal space. And the last thing to add here is that with gold prices high, it's, uh, it's very sad that Octedi's temporary closure and um, Pogari Pogera joint ventures mining operations have been suspended, which means that uh, GDP growth will be uh, slower in recovery. So in conclusion, so overall the, uh, the impact that we see from COVID-19 is actually accentuating the trends that we've been experiencing in the last six to eight years. So trends in falling formal employment, uh, large fiscal deficits, uh, very mild non-resource growth and uh, the increasing debt burden. Uh, the exchange rate is the only policy lever available right now for government to use. So it can allow a managed depreciation of the Kina, but it refused to do so. And the reforms um, going forward will be undermined by a looming vote of no confidence um, in November of this year, a misconception of stability hold held by many uh, government employees, uh, the durability of leading civil servants who are resistant to change, right? The gradual deterioration, um, which as opposed to a sudden deterioration, thus uh, does not make them or prompt them to uh, adopt reforms and external financing that is not, external financing available that is not uh, conditional on policy reforms. So that was all, thank you all. We've only got some 10 to um, 15 minutes left for question time. Even um, would you like to uh, take on some of those questions that came on Q&A? And then we'll go to Jenny and um, Nilesh. Sure. I'm happy to start, although I know a lot of the questions are for Jenny. So I'll, 
but there are a few, uh, anyway, there's some excellent questions. Um, and um, if I answer all the ones I could, it's going to take the whole session. So I'll just answer a few. Uh, I thought this is a, I wanted to, uh, so I think I, um, can you see the question now? If I click that or no? Could we ask this you is, to maybe um, identify? From Courtney Cleary. Uh, she actually asked two questions. Um, the type answer. Oops. Anyway, sorry, I'm not. For, uh, Courtney asked a question about uh, Fiji and how do we get such a low stimulus package, uh, funding package for Fiji when if you look at the IMF database, they have this massive stimulus. Um, and that's a really uh, important question because it uh, goes to what we're, you know, discussing here. Uh, so if I could just briefly um, share the relevant PowerPoint slide um, without taking up too much time. Um, uh, oops. Yeah, so yeah, we, we are showing this very low uh, funding package for Fiji. Um, and it really comes from here. So Fiji does, Fiji includes its uh, financing in the stimulus. So does, um, so does several countries actually. Uh, but what we're trying to do when we're looking at the spending is just strip away uh, financing, uh, strip away uh, private sector contributions, uh, and really focus on what the government is spending. So that's the difference between the stimulus package as a whole and the actual uh, COVID spend that we focus on in this presentation. But if you, if you go to the database, uh, then you'll find both. And so you can, you can analyze what you want. But in this presentation, I was focusing on the, um, on the COVID spend. Um, and then there were a few questions about that spend and, and what, it's, uh, what it's being spent on. And, um, I think, uh, yeah, Tanushri asked uh, about um, gender uh, spending. So I don't know if you can share that question, Ari, um, so others can see it, but she asked about whether there's, whether any of the spending is on uh, uh, violence against women and children. And in fact, again, if you go to the database, uh, we do um, uh, cover that, but the answer is, you know, very little. Uh, in fact, only uh, Solomon Islands has some sort of uh, community, and even then it's not for violence against women and children, it's some, it's, it's, I think it's called support for women and, and children, something like that. Uh, so yeah, I think if you, you could do a, a, a fuller gender analysis, certainly, but uh, you don't really see it. It's not really visible in these, uh, in these spending packages. Um, uh, Tess Newton-Kane asked a, a really good question about Vanuatu. And also I want to acknowledge the work Tess has done in putting together the aid support that um, the Pacific's received, which we draw on heavily in our database. Um, yeah, I've seen this test that actually uh, Vanuatu's uh, seem, the economy seems to be doing okay, which is sort of surprising. And maybe it is the agricultural sector is, is, or in, yeah, other business has been underestimated, which of course would be a great thing if that's what emerges. But what I understand the debate is in uh, Vanuatu is do you continue in terms of extending the safety net, which is what you asked, you know, do we continue just supporting those few people who were lucky enough once to have a formal sector job, even though they've been unlucky enough now to have lost it, or should we be uh, providing uh, support more broadly? So uh, they're having that debate. Uh, I think that's a problem with just focusing on the formal sector, especially when you know, unlike Fiji, the Vanuatu formal sector is pretty, is pretty small. Um, you know, I think most countries are just in a state where they are borrowing whatever they can and getting whatever aid they can. And I think that's reasonable, given that it is a crisis. Uh, but Vanuatu is one of those countries, um, I mean, like Timor Leste, right, where they do have a lot of money set aside. And um, they, they need to have more, of a, they can't afford to have more, and they should have more of a multi-year plan. Uh, so I think that would be my, my advice for Vanuatu. Thank you, Ivan. Um, if we could go to Dr. Jenny, um, there's been several questions that have been directed to you, Dr. Gordon. Um, if you look through the Q&A and, uh, and uh, if you'd like to take any of those. 
Um, yes, there's lots of really good questions and I've answered a couple online. Um, there's this one, is DFAT going to rethink reform AIFFP given these challenges? Um, AIFFP is uh, the uh, Australian um, Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific, I think I've got that right. Um, and it has been focused very much on um, the sort of economic infrastructure of things like communication, uh, linkages, cables, um, electricity systems, water supply systems, um, and those sorts of areas. So we are having a number of discussions. Obviously, large infrastructure projects take a long time to actually, you know, design properly, get up and running. Um, and so there's always, it's hard to sort of pivot really quickly. Um, I think there's various views, but um, one of the things that is clearly really important and had already been an agenda for AIFFP was to ensure that these infrastructure investments are, are made in ways that build skills within the countries um, who are making that investment because these are loans, loan financed as well as grant financed. So um, it's a mixture of, of loans and grants. The grants are more for the development period and then a loan to government. Some governments, we did have some in the pipeline with Fiji, have put infrastructure investment on hold for the moment because they're focusing on other priorities. But one of the things that AIFFP is looking for is making sure that, um, you know, we're thinking of infrastructure that uses more local labour. And um, so we are looking at some of the, the more labour intensive kinds of investments, whereas previously we would, might have been focused a bit more on ones that were purely on um, sort of economic merit. So um, that uh, can be things like um, road maintenance programs and, um, and some of those areas. So that's the sort of the, the way AIFFP is, is thinking of pivoting. Um, there was a really, really good question that I wish I knew the answer to. Um, I think we all did, which was that, um, I can't find it immediately, but it was a great question because it was about um, how can we find recovery pathways that are more equitable, bring more equitable outcomes, and then also gender outcomes. Uh, DFAT has a something called EMIF, which is um, a shocking acronym, but it's um, emerging markets and it's looking at sort of financing. And one of the areas it's got programs and is funding is um, financing for women-led women enterprises. So small scale women-led enterprises. And I think that those sorts of, um, those sorts of uh, initiatives are really important to try and um, balance up some of the, the biases that are inherently there in, in capital markets. Um, which make it very difficult for women in particular to access finance. But I think access, private sector access to finance is going to be absolutely critical for recovery within the, the Pacific regions. And the challenge is how to um, think about, uh, you know, as a, as a major donor, how do you work that so you can leverage private sector finance effectively it's a really challenging area and it's certainly one that we're investigating further. And so I think, um, terrific question, really hard to answer, but I think it comes down to really getting that private sector working well, and then also making sure that the government is um, putting in place the best environment for smaller scale of smaller medium enterprise private sector um, to actually thrive. So uh, getting the regulatory framework right getting the tax systems right, providing the, the infrastructure that they need and getting the, um, the human capital that these, um, these small enterprises need to be able to, um, to do a good job. So I'll leave it at, at that one. So to give plenty of time, because I'm sure there's questions to, um, to others as well. Over. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. Um, if we could um, get Nilesh, um you answering some of the questions that have been put to you and then Maho. Um, after that, if we could invite questions live, Ari from the media um, in the group of participants, if there any media from the Pacific. Thank, thank you, um, Nilesh. Uh, you'll have to unmute yourself, Nilesh. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, the question to, that Jenny just answered, I think I'll just uh, give Fiji's uh, uh, angle or perspective to that um, to that question. I think one of the ways through which we can ensure uh, recovery, which takes pro poor growth into account, uh, is to, to target the industries uh, or the sectors. So agriculture, for instance, should be one of the strategies in Fiji because majority of the households or the individual who we have defined as living in poverty in Fiji um, are concentrated in the agriculture sector. So any strategy to reduce poverty or, track, or making sure that we make a dent on poverty or pro poor growth must take agriculture into, into account. And there's a lot of scope for expansion in agriculture. And what we saw in Fiji in the last 10 years was uh, policy that skewed more towards tourism rather than rather than agriculture and I think it, uh, the COVID-19 crisis provides an opportune time uh, to redirect some of those energy uh, policy uh, policies as well uh, towards agriculture. Uh, one reason is this high concentration of, uh, of, of people who are defined as living in poverty. Secondly, as, as one of the uh, someone raised a question regarding food security, it can be important for food security reasons as well. And almost 45% of Fiji's population still live in rural areas and are connected to agriculture. So agriculture would be a strategy through which um, a recovery uh, could, could take care of that pro poor uh, growth angle uh, as well. So uh, while I look for the others, you can, someone else can take yeah. over here. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, Maho, um, did you see any of the questions that were directed to you that you'd like to answer in the Q&A? Maybe while, yeah? Yeah, so uh, the last question on capital flight. Uh, the, there's no data for the second quarter of 14G, but uh, from what I've seen, uh, delayed Frida and Papua and G negotiations could lead to a bit um, delayed uh, capital inflows. Um, and FDI has been generally low in the past seven to eight years. And also there have been lower expansion in the forestry sector. Actually, a lot of forest, uh, forestry companies have been closing down, have been contracting in operations. So yeah, that, I hope that answers the question. Yes, so I, if I may answer that part as well, in, in Fiji's case, uh, as at June, the foreign reserves were about 2.1 billion, slightly lower than, uh, than May. So I don't think we have seen the kind of capital flight that we saw, I mean, in the previous uh, political crisis, 87 coup and 2000 coup and 2006, uh, the kind of capital flight that we saw during the, we haven't seen anything like this uh, during this time. So. Foreign reserves are uh, still sufficient to cover about um, six to seven months of, of uh, imports of uh, goods and services. Okay, um, th thank you panelists, thank you participants. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. So thank you all um, once again for joining us. Please look at the database which goes live uh, um, after this session. We will also run several blogs on it, which is going to appear on the Dev Policy blog site and, uh, uh, and be published as newspaper articles across, across the Pacific. So look out for those. To finish off, next up, please uh, um, register for our next uh, panel, which is going to be on di gender differences in social learning amongst Vanuatu cocoa growers. Um, so until then, vina kavakalevu, mwade manda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Great session, guys.